we're saying Merry Christmas again. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the first ever Humanist Report Christmas special. I'd like to call this my war on Fox News's war on Christmas. So, really, it wouldn't be Christmas, I don't think, without this tradition of Fox News sounding the alarm about how libs are trying to destroy everything. So, as you all know, over the course of the holiday season, I've been covering the war on Christmas, and I thought that I would put together all of the segments we did so we can all enjoy them in their totality as I think they're meant to be enjoyed. So in this first segment here, I talked about how Dave Rubin and fucker, I mean Tucker Carlson, defended Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer from the lips. Enjoy. It is officially my favorite time of year. It's the Christmas season, and specifically for those of you who don't live in the United States, this is when us liberals team up and we launch an all-out assault on the holiday. At least that's what Fox News and Republicans want you to think, but in actuality, we're celebrating just like everyone else. I mean, I've got the hat, I've got my ugly Christmas sweater, and I've got the tree just for this segment. But nonetheless, Fox News has been sounding the alarms for years now about how liberals want to ruin Christmas. The evidence being that liberals think people should maybe say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas, or that Starbucks changed the color of their cups to red. And this year, to no one's surprise, it's absolutely no different. So this time, we're going to hear from Coke sellout Dave Rubin, who's going to join the chorus of idiocy by going on Tucker Carlson's show on Fox News and discussing how libs are ruining Rudolph now. Even Rudolph is nothing sacred. But Dave, as I'm watching that, all of a sudden I had this kind of panic feeling and thinking, maybe I fell for an elaborate, ironic prank from HuffPo. And then I realized, no, because they don't have a sense of humor. I mean, but reassure me, yeah. this is real, right? Tucker, very quickly on the last segment, I swear to you, I thought you were the highest paid man in television. I am shocked and I'm going to, you know, I don't get I don't get paid for these appearances, but I'm going to mail you a check for somewhere between 15 and 20 dollars. OK, that aside, I appreciate yes, that, this is. Yeah, you got it, my friend. Listen, these these puff piece of Huffington Poe. I mean, look, these pieces that these that these authors, whatever they are, journalists that they write. These are not pieces of journalism. It's so much easier to destroy and than to create. If you're watching Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and think it's about racism and misogyny and the patriarchy and the rest of it, well, you can find that stuff everywhere. If you look back at anything, and that's, that's what people really need to understand when these pieces come out and then you start looking at something that you used to love or that used to have a wonderful message about the holiday and giving and being accepted and all of those things, that they're trying to take that away from you. And it's not like they stop with one thing. Thing, right? They find something, they kind of destroy that, and they'll move on to everything else that we love. So, you know, eventually they'll move on to sitcoms that we love, whether it's Seinfeld for, you know, exactly. doing something they've done, or, or Friends, or whatever else it is. They'll go for cartoons, they've gone for Bugs Bunny. I mean, they will literally go for a sunset. Think of whoever's watching this right now, think of something you love that brings you a sense of peace and decency, and they will somehow link it to the patriarchy and the rest of their politically correct nonsense and we just need to we need to realize that as i said earlier it's easier to destroy than create well, and that's, that's the what they're smartest. just going to so keep just, doing and i think what right we there? have to do is create that's such a smart point what are we creating what is being created in this moment of destruction right now do you uh, make me feel well, better well that's what i'm worried about yeah. yeah, well, that's what I'm worried about, because there is some legitimacy that some of the things happening in the country and in the world should be destroyed at some yes. level. Look, we've got major problems in academia. We've got major right, we problems want some change. in the media. I agree. Absolutely. So we want some change, but but anyone can burn anything down. And the question is, we've put up so much goodness in the world. The United States and, and Western world has put up so much goodness related to freedom. We live in the freest country ever. We can do whatever we want in this country. And if your job all day long is to write pieces that actually destroy the stories that we're built on, and then don't offer an alternative. I mean, exactly. that's the thing. They never offer an alternative. Or if they do, it usually is about power to the state, which is actually dystopian, not utopian. So that's what we have to watch out for. And, you know, it's unfortunate. 
unfortunate because they write these things and then, you know, yeah. guys like us, we feel like we have to respond to them because no, we don't want people being brainwashed. But I'm glad that we did because you just issued a challenge, I think, to the rest of us, which is create. You know, we, we need to create more. Let's create, totally man. Let's create. So just watching that, you might instinctively feel as if what you just saw was nothing more than stupidity in action and being broadcasted to millions of Americans, but it gets dumber as you get more of the context. I assure you of that. Now, what's great is that the notion that elements of this cartoon could somehow be problematic was so absurd to Tucker that he was worried that he was somehow being duped by, quote, an elaborate or ironic prank from HuffPost until he realized that couldn't be the case because, quote, they don't have a sense of humor. Well, we're going to see why he's wrong about that in a minute because the actual article they're talking about was not meant to be taken seriously. In fact, it wasn't even an article or an editorial at all, so he's wrong. But I want to get to what Dave Rubin says here because he really makes this argument that nothing really is sacred anymore to these goddamn liberals. They're going to ruin everything. They're going to look for misogyny and homophobia and white supremacy where it doesn't even exist. I mean, something as benign as a cartoon can't possibly be problematic, can it? <laughs> If you look back at cartoons from the early 1900s, they were pretty problematic to say the least. So of course we can look back as we progress as a society and see that maybe some things weren't as great as we once thought they were. I mean, if you watch a bunch of comedies from the mid 2000s, some of them were incredibly homophobic. It's just that they passed it off as comedy so nobody really noticed. But I mean, we're just becoming a little bit more cognizant of these things because culture has changed. Pointing that out doesn't make me an overly politically correct SJW. It just makes me an observer of a society that is continuously evolving both socially and culturally. I mean, these norms are changing and they're changing significantly pretty rapidly because that's what happens when you live in a modern society. And guess what? what? I'm glad that norms change. Dave Rubin should be really thankful that norms and uh, societal values change, given that he is a gay man who will remind you about that every five minutes. But the underlying implication is that liberals in criticizing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, they're somehow trying to take that away from you. They want to get it banned from television, but that's not, that's not correct at all. It's just that political norms, social norms, cultural norms evolve. That's it, and they're just pointing it out. They're saying, oh, wow, maybe Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the characters in that show, were a little bit more asshole than I originally remembered. And that's essentially what they were saying, but more on what Dave Rubin says here. He adds, I mean, they will literally go for sunset. Think for whoever's watching this now. Think of something you love that brings you a sense of peace and decency, and they will somehow link it to the patriarchy and the rest of their politically correct nonsense, and we need to realize it's easier to destroy then create. So I want you conservatives watching Fox News right now to close your eyes. Think about something that's precious to you, something that you hold the most dear in your heart. Now, also imagine a liberal. Imagine them coming in and destroying that thing you hold most dear to your heart. I mean, Dave, if you're going to try to fearmonger about the opposition, you've got to be at least a little bit more reasonable and more subtle in your demonization. Otherwise, you're going to come off as a hack, and that's exactly what you came off as. He's not even trying to be a good propagandist here. He's just saying liberals basically hate everything you like, and that's why you should be against liberals. I mean, you've got to try harder than that. How are you going to actually convince people that they should hate liberals if you're not even giving them a valid reason? I mean, Sunset, Dave? You think we're against Sunset? <laughs> what a fucking dumbass. Uh, look, Dave... <laughs> This is so stupid. Um, I mean, I knew that the war on Christmas controversy was inevitable. You know, the minute, you know, uh, December rolled around, I was just waiting. And they're getting dumber each year. I thought that the Starbucks cup controversy was probably the lowest of the low in terms of how stupid political discourse gets with regard to the supposed war on Christmas. But this is definitely something that is dumber. And it gets dumber when you actually know about the article they're talking about. So the question really is, what did this Huffington Post editor say about Rudolph that got Dave Rubin's panties in a bunch? Because Dave Rubin implied throughout this segment multiple times 
that this editor was trying to promote the idea that Rudolph was bad. Well, let's actually look at the article. If you go to the comedy section of Huffington Post, you'll find the article in question is titled, Viewers Noticed Some Very Disturbing Details in Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, where the author doesn't necessarily editorialize, but instead shares tweets about the cartoon that he found humorous. So he saw that Rudolph was trending, he looked on Twitter at some of these tweets, and he shared the tweets that he found funny. In fact, he actually states, quote, Some people joked that they noticed a few things in the Christmas classic that they didn't always spot or simply ignored when they saw it years ago. Here are some of those humorous observations. I will never not tweet this when Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is trending. Roses are red. Elf practice is avoidable. Deviation from the norm will be punished unless it's exploitable. Watching Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the moral of the story I've learned since watching it as a kid, people are dicks until they need something from you. My saddest takeaway from Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is how mean and dismissive Santa is. Really, Santa? Nothing says holiday spirit quite like dissecting Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and realizing almost everyone is an ass. Comet legit encouraged bullying and exclusion. I can even buy into his father being terrible, but Santa? That's messed up. Hashtag Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. So this is what all of the commotion was about. Dave Rubin and Tucker Carlson were responding to outrage over this article when it was nothing more than the author sharing funny tweets about Rudolph from people who were making fun of the cartoon. And it wasn't just that these were all political tweets. The author even shared some apolitical tweets. For example, somebody said they refused to Google Burl Ives because they don't want to know what he actually looks like because that would ruin their image of him as the snowman. It also included a tweet from someone who poked fun at liberals, saying that Yukon Cornelius was the first hipster. But because some people pointed out how mean the characters were, how misogynistic Rudolph's dad was, and how Rudolph was being bullied, that was enough for Tucker Carlson and Dave Rubin to get together to deem these tweets controversy and put out this idiotic segment about how SJWs ruin everything. And now they're coming after your beloved Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer cartoons. Now, I'm not even 100% sure if Dave Rubin entirely understood what it was that liberals were supposedly offended by, because most of the outrage I've seen came from a tweet HuffPost made where they shared a video of the cartoon and they said, the holiday TV classic Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is seriously problematic. Now, you'd think, based on what they tweeted there, that this was the source for all of the outrage, but really... All they did was do more of what the article I showed you did, share more tweets from people. And they don't even necessarily criticize the cartoon as a whole for being politically incorrect or anything like that. They just simply go on to say what we all kind of thought when we watched it again, that the characters were a lot shittier than we may have remembered as children. So it was kind of a narrative criticism. It was a critique of the characters, not the cartoon as a whole, and there were some specific examples that they pointed out, like how Clarice's dad was bigoted towards Rudolph because he didn't want his daughter to be seen in public with a reindeer with a red nose, and some people speculated about whether or not this was a parable for racism and interracial dating, which honestly doesn't seem too far off to me, but the reason why I question whether or not Dave Rubin understood why liberals were supposedly offended is because he kept referencing the author and implied that this was a written article that they were responding to that was trying to gin up outrage when in actuality as i stated most conservatives were responding to a tweet from huff post and tucker even played the video that huff post tweeted out alongside them for the entirety of their discussion so either dave rubin actually did take issue with the article i read to you that was in the comedy section of huff post or he didn't even know that they were supposed to be talking about the video that was posted to huff posts Twitter account, and he decided to just utilize the generic right-wing talking points he typically uses when discussing issues of this nature, and he brought up political correctness, the outrage machine, and what have you. Regardless, he didn't even respond to a specific example of supposed outrage, which leads me to believe he's just jumping on the bad wagon here when he clearly doesn't feel passionate or give a shit about this issue at all. And understand the irony here. They're the ones who are saying liberals look for controversy and everything, but here they are 
looking for controversy where there was none to be found. And their agenda is crystal clear. They're doing everything they can to find examples of liberal outrage so they can prop up that great SJW boogeyman and claim that it's an existential threat to mankind. That's what they're trying to do. Meanwhile, their side, the side they do propaganda for, actually does pose a real existential threat to mankind. Donald Trump and the Republican Party, who get paid to deny climate science. That's the real threat. But what they want you to think is that these SJWs, they ruin everything and now they're trying to ruin Rudolph. Well, nobody here is saying that Rudolph should be banned. These people are saying, well, you know, Rudolph is a little bit different than how I remembered it. There's a little bit more dickheadedness from the characters. There's some misogyny from Rudolph's dad. And uh, yeah, it's not how I remembered it. Casually pointing this out is not controversy. But Fox News, in the way that they claim we always do, they try to look for controversy because them talking about the supposed outrage mas machine, not only is that part of the outrage machine that they denounce, but it's them propping up their side, saying, look, Republicans care about the issues, liberals care about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Aren't they silly? Let's bring on Dave Rubin to talk about how liberals are going to be against Sunset. They see misogyny and patriarchy in Sunset. Yeah, we see controversy everywhere, even where it's not. It's like we're looking for it. It's almost as if you're looking for it, Dave Rubin and Tucker Carlson. I'm sure the irony went right over their heads. Wow, that was absolutely uh, wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Dave Rubin and Tucker Carlson. So in this next clip here, we're going to see that Satanists, who I think are among the libs, also tried to destroy the holiday by being all Satan-y with equal representation to make sure that the government doesn't acknowledge one religion over the others. But we also have some other gems in there, like the conservative duo, Dilk. So, enjoy. I made fun of Fox News for sounding the alarms about the so-called war on Christmas, but this week, I'm kind of eating my own words because I think they may actually be onto something. There may actually be a war on Christmas. And I found evidence that there's a war on Christmas myself because I walked into a department store looking for the cassette tape version of NSYNC's Home for Christmas and it was nowhere to be found. I could find it everywhere when I was a kid, but all of a sudden, it is nowhere to be found, which is evidence that things have changed, which is evidence that there's an all-out assault on Christmas, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I don't think you need any more evidence, because I think that that alone, that anecdotal example, confirms beyond a shadow of a doubt that there is a war on Christmas, but if that wasn't enough, then Fox News is going to have another example for you. This year in the state of Illinois, in the Capitol building in Springfield, they now have added a satanic statue to its official holiday display between a Christmas tree and a menorah. The sculpture, funded by the Satanic Temple of Chicago, depicts a hand holding an apple with a snake wrapped around it. Is political correctness taking over the Christmas season? Joining us right now to weigh in is the host of the Mike Slater Show. Mike Slater joins us from San Diego. San Diego. Mike, what do you think about the fact that the satanic group has put this particular piece of art next to a Christmas tree and a menorah? Yeah, you know, Steve, with this story in particular, I, uh, I used to get really outraged by this, but right now I'm, I'm just, I feel sad. I feel sad for them. Uh, they're so deceived. Uh, I think this is a sign of, of how prosperous we are here in America, uh, where these people don't think they need God. And they get their kicks out of mocking God. They get their kicks out of mocking this religion and mocking uh, 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 Christmas in general. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's not going to affect my walk with God. It's not going to affect what happens inside my house. It's not going to affect what I teach my kids and the Bible. Uh, so I just feel sad for these people. A, a friend of mine just got back, two days ago, got back from a, a Middle Eastern country. Right. 
and he had to go to underground churches where they had one wow. Bible, and truly, if they got caught, they would be killed. Uh, so people over there aren't worshiping Satan openly, so right. it's, it's a shame that Americans here are abusing the freedoms here when they could be worshiping God. Hang on a second, because I think we really need to take a moment to dissect what Steve Ducey is saying here, because... He talks about the Satanic Temple statue and how outrageous it is. And then he asks the question, is political correctness taking over the Christmas season? Wait, aren't you the one who's being too politically correct? Seeing that you're the one who's outraged by something? Why is it that when liberals are offended by something, we're being too politically correct, but when conservatives are offended, it's still the liberals who are being too politically correct? I don't, th <laughs> I don't think that it works that way, Steve, and if it does, then it shouldn't. You should realize that there's a double standard there, but nonetheless, Mike Slater joins the conversation to talk about how appalled he is. In fact, he doesn't even have words. He's so upset by this that he doesn't even know what to say he used to get outraged by this but now he's just sad for us sad for us atheist satan worshipers i think that was the implication but specifically he says i used to get really outraged by this but right now i just feel sad for them they're so deceived i think this is a sign for how prosperous we are in america where these people think they don't need God and they get their kicks out of mocking God. <laughs> Hail Satan 666. Well, if you knew anything about politics and economics and income inequality, you know that people, generally speaking, aren't that prosperous. It's the elites who are taking all the wealth. And these elites get coverage by the network that you're on, Fox News. But that's a whole nother rabbit hole. What he says here is that we are mocking God. No, there is religious symbols on public property. So if you're going to give them representation, then you also have to give representation to other religions that you view as more unorthodox, including Satanism. And what they don't get is that the satanic temple is trolling them. If there is some type of statue like the Ten Commandments on public property, well then what the satanic temple does is make a constitutionally sound argument and get their own version of a statue put up and it's absolutely great because fox news walks into this trap every single time now mike slater goes on to talk about his friend what's his name who just returned home from the middle east who claimed that he was in a country in the middle east where people would be killed if they were caught with a bible Okay, we're going to need more details because for one, if this country is as totalitarian as you say it is, I doubt your friend would want to go there. Second of all, is it Saudi Arabia? Because this sounds the most like Saudi Arabia. Now, what's this guy not telling you? Well, not only would they kill you if they caught you with the Bible, they'd also kill you for being an atheist or gay or a Satan worshiper. But he didn't want to tell you that. He conveniently left that part out because it wouldn't fit into his Christian persecution complex narrative. But he goes on to make the most ridiculous point ever about how we're actually abusing the freedom we have because we're not using it to worship God. But isn't that the whole point of freedom? You can do what you want and we can do what we want. You can worship God and we can worship the devil. Now, I don't believe in the devil because I don't believe in any religion. I'm an atheist. But if I did want to worship the devil, then you're not going to stop me because we do live in a free country with freedom of religion. And specifically, more importantly for this discussion, separation of church and state. So if you're going to expect representation for your religion on public property, then expect Satanists to get representation as well. But this example doesn't necessarily lend too much credence to the claim that there's a war on Christmas because it's just not a very compelling example. The Satanists are also celebrating Christmas, albeit in their own way. So, Fucker Carlson, I mean, Tucker Carlson is going to come in and give us another example that he found, a really obscure example, 
that he found to demonstrate that the war on Christmas isn't as laughable as liberals want you to believe. Well, the war on Christmas is totally fake. They always tell you that on TV, but it's also underway again and got off to a hot start last week with the left launching a new offensive against Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Now the war machine is opening up new fronts faster than we can keep up, but we're trying. An elementary school principal in Nebraska has banned a whole swath of Christmas-related items from his school. That would include Christmas trees, elves, Santa, and red-green color combinations. How about candy canes? Are they allowed? No, they're banned too. Why? Because they're in the shape of a J, which represents Jesus. Mark Stein is an author and columnist. He joins us tonight. You know, I just want to say again, the war on Christmas is not real, Mark, so stop talking about no. it, you right-wing right no, no. fox guy. Yeah, entirely fictitious. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, bite, I'll bite on that and go back a, a couple of centuries, Tucker. You know, uh, the separation of church and state, when the founders came up with it, it's basically that they didn't want President Washington being the head of the Church of America as the Queen is head of the Church of England. That's it. They didn't want the Archbishop of Virginia sitting in the Senate as the Archbishop yeah. of Canterbury sits in the House of Lords. And like a lot of uh, sane concepts, it's uh, metastasized into something utterly insane. Okay, so was it just me, or did that last guy sound exactly like Kyle Kalinske's impression of elitist snobs? Bow! Bow your head to the wonderful John McCain, good sir. Don't you know that this is how Americans want you to act? Please show the establishment the respect it deserves. Thank you very much. The resemblance is uncanny. <laughs> it really like struck me when I first heard him talk because it sounds exactly like Kyle. I think Kyle should collect royalties from this guy because that is very, very similar, eerily similar. So basically, to get to the segment itself, Tucker Carlson is pushing back against us pushing back against him pushing back against the war on Christmas. And he has evidence that there's a war on Christmas because he found one example from one school in one area in the country. So because you found one example of someone doing things you deemed anti-Christmas, well, apparently, that's it. You can wash your hands. You found evidence that there is, in fact, a war on Christmas. Do you really want to play this game, Tucker? I don't think you want to play this game because if you think that one example is emblematic of the totality of the left, then I could find examples of pretty problematic Republicans. So let's play this game. A Republican neo-Nazi won his primary just this year, so I guess that that means every single Republican is a neo-Nazi. An anti-gay Republican got caught up in a sex scandal. I guess that means that every single Republican is gay. Ten Republicans in Louisiana voted against a bill that criminalized bestiality. I guess that means every single Republican is into bestiality. Would you look at that? I mean, do you see why we don't play this game, fucker? I mean, Tucker? Because that's what happens. If you're gonna cherry pick and isolate one example and try to prop that up as an accurate representation of your opponents, we can do the same goddamn thing. But he's convinced that, you know, we shouldn't make fun of him, you know, because it's really mean because there is this war on Christmas. And he's not alone because the conservative duo collectively known as Dilk also chimed in when it comes to the war on Christmas. And they want us to stop making fun of baby Jesus. Massachusetts church receiving massive backlash over a controversial nativity scene, which included placing a baby Jesus inside a cage. Yes, and writing the word deportation over the wise men. All of this is a way to quote, spark a conversation about the current illegal immigration situation at the border. Here with their thoughts, Diamond and Silk. So I guess they're trying to make a point about, you know, Donald Trump separated families. He put kids in cages. I mean, what are you guys supposed to say about that? Obama put baby Jesus in a cage first? Well, here's the deal. I think what the church should be focusing on 
is uh, uh, Planned Parenthood, how they take and abort babies. I think that's what they should be focused on. They should be focused on all of the hate that's going on from the Democratic Party and Democrats that hate this sitting president. That's what they should be focused on instead of putting baby Jesus in a cage, because Donald Trump didn't do that. That was right. done up under the Obama administration. What Donald Trump did, President Trump did, was follow the law. And it's really sad that I see these churches wanting to make a mockery of people's faith and religion and traditions. It's really, really sad. That is a clear example of the war on Christmas because that church made a mockery of baby Jesus by putting him in a cage. It's not Donald Trump who is supposedly a Christian who actually put real children in cages. It's this church who made a mockery of their religion who's waging this war on Christmas. And my question is, why didn't they talk about this cat who was also making a mockery of their religion? Because photographer Brooke Goldman captured this photo of a cat actually sitting in the cradle that baby Jesus was born in. I mean, how much more evidence do you liberals need to see before you acknowledge the fact that there is a war on Christmas? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean, this is the um, level of absurdity we're reaching here. Now, they decided to use the hypocrite argument, where you pivot to a different example and say, well, you don't care about issue X, which is more important than issue Y, so you must be a hypocrite. And they say, well, you know, if this church really cares about kids being in cages, and presumably that means they care about babies, they should do more to stop abortion. Okay, that's great. If you want to up the ante that way, we could up the ante as well and say, well, if you care about abortion, Dilk 1 and Dilk 2, then why don't you advocate for increased access to contraception? Because that's the one thing that actually reduces abortions. Why don't you support that? Furthermore, why don't you call on your president, who you love and support so much, to stop giving Saudi Arabia bombs that they're using to drop on children in Yemen? And of course, they also invoked the typical whataboutism argument. Oh, what? Trump did this? That's bad? Well, Obama also did this, that's bad. But you see, the reason why this doesn't work against progressives, the reason why people like H.A. Goodman are face planting in an attempt to own the libs by using this argument is because we don't claim to like Obama. You claim to like Donald Trump. We claim to dislike both Obama and Trump. So by saying, well, yeah, I know that Donald Trump did this thing that's unethical, but Obama also did it. Well, if you dislike Obama and he did something that Trump is now doing, then shouldn't it just logically follow that you dislike Trump for doing what Obama did? I mean, it doesn't make sense to me. This is why whataboutism doesn't necessarily make for a compelling argument, because you're pointing out the flaws in someone the left supposedly supports in order to validate what Donald Trump is doing, but really, it should logically follow that you stop supporting Donald Trump because he's doing what the president who you don't like is doing. But I don't want to get too far off topic here, because the point is that there's a war on Christmas, or at least Fox News wants you to think that there's a war on Christmas. And if there's any example anywhere in the country, no matter how insignificant it is, you can count on Fox News to find it and exploit the shit out of it for political gain. Happy holidays, everyone. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. So we are now getting to our final segment. This is the grand finale where the ultimate battle is being waged on Christmas. Tucker Carlson decided to call out the left's war on gingerbread cookies because he's a serious news person. And this is proof that you should take him seriously because he's outraged by cookies. Enjoy. One of my favorite things about the holiday season is all of the different types of cookies we get to eat because my mom usually makes these really bomb peanut butter balls, and I also love sugar cookies. In fact, I went out of my way to make my own sugar cookies, and no, this isn't prepackaged dough. I did it myself, and I decorated it, and even if it's a little bit burnt, and it looks like a four-year-old did it, I still made my own holiday trees, which I'm very proud of. 
Now, notice how I went out of my way to avoid saying Christmas tree and I said holiday tree because Hail Satan 666. the point is that I like cookies. Now, another individual who also loves cookies is a man named Fucker Carlson. I mean, Tucker Carlson. Now, Tucker Carlson is a newscaster who wants you to think he's serious because oftentimes he'll stare directly into your soul for minutes at a time. And while his expressions may range from confused to amused, the overall takeaway is always that he's a very serious news journalist and you should definitely take him seriously. So let's go ahead and watch him be outraged by gingerbread cookies. Literally. Well, the war on Christmas is not real. They tell you it all the time. It's totally fake. And if you believe in it, you're dumb. You watch Fox News or something. But it's also, of course, uh, going on. <laughs> it's being fought very fiercely here in America, but not just in America. The war on Christmas is a global struggle. In the Parliament of Scotland, they have a national parliament. The coffee shop has stopped selling gingerbread men. Why? Gender specific. They're now called gingerbread people. You don't want to give them a gender without their consent. You don't even want to know how many bathrooms there are in gingerbread houses now. A lot. Tammy Bruce is a radio host and president of Independent Women's Voice, and she joins us tonight. Tammy, so I have this, I have this sneaking suspicion that a lot of the people who are doing things like this are actually right-wing plants <laughs> there to discredit the progressives they live among. Do you think that's possible? Uh, I don't. I, I think, though, that they're... <laughs> it's don't. Uh, but, the, I, I know. It's, for, it's very funny. And now I've been starting to think about the complicated structure of gingerbread houses because of your comment. I'm just wondering how many bathrooms can they get into one house? Um, but look, uh, here is the problem. And it just proves, of course, our point in general. Uh, the left has worked now for a couple of generations to condition us to ahead of time worry about what we're going to say. Uh, even your last segment, of course, is about that a little bit of, of challenging people and threatening them and making sure that they know that there's danger in those thoughts. Uh, and so this baker, uh, it, it, she said it was a whim that she just thought, you just like for no good reason, that she should uh, not call them gingerbread men and call them a gingerbread person. And I couldn't tell, obviously, because they're also not wearing clothes. So it's hard to say what it is that they're, they, they are and what they're doing and what they're not doing. But she said she was also shocked by the response. And that's the good news, Tucker, is that this is in, in uh, again, Scotland, the United Kingdom. And the backlash, she was apparently shocked that people were really upset about this. And I contend, after a series of, you know, living your entire life being kind of bullied into what you can and cannot say and presumptions right. that you're bad people, that it can be the smallest thing that tips you over the edge. That's, a, that's the tipping point. And in this case, it's, you know, calling gingerbread men a gingerbread person when obviously they're men. Well, so maybe the lesson is that the rest of us shouldn't participate in our own spiritual neutering and that, that we correct. should at every step along the way say I'm not I'm not complying with that, that I'm is sorry correct. call HR on me I'm not doing it <coughs> this shit is dry yeah so <coughs> that shit was dumb so presumably because Tucker Carlson ran out of examples and anecdotes of the war on Christmas that he could find in the United States, he decided to go elsewhere and look for an example where he found that someone is waging a war on Christmas. And it's this one baker who decided to, quote, on a whim, call her cookies gingerbread people instead of gingerbread men. <laughs> God damn it! Now, she was then met with outrage and was, quote, shocked that people were upset about this. Now, what's interesting to me is that as they talk about people being outraged over these gender-neutral cookies, the problem is that the framing suggests that it's actually left-wingers who are the ones who are outraged by everything and too politically correct. But here, we see an example of right-wingers, albeit in a different country, but right-wingers nonetheless, I'm assuming, being outraged by something they clearly shouldn't be outraged by. But nonetheless, I got to congratulate Tucker Carlson here. You found the war on Christmas. This is the definitive example of a war on Christmas, if I've ever seen one. Now, fucker, I mean, Tucker also added, maybe the lesson is that the rest of us shouldn't participate in our own spiritual neutering. Yeah, I don't really know what that means. Does anyone know what that means? Spiritual neutering? How is one baker at one bakery on the other side of the world neutering you spiritually. 
that honestly doesn't make sense and I don't know what he's talking about. But really, um, the real lesson here, contrary to what Tucker wants you to think is the real lesson, is that serious people don't care about cookies for one, and we especially don't care about gingerbread cookies because they're fucking disgusting. But second of all, if you decide to use your platform to discuss how outraged you are over gingerbread cookies, you are adding to the chorus of outrage you often denounce. Fucker. I mean, Tucker. But I do actually want to move on to a more serious topic and discuss what amounts to essentially kind of a ban on people saying Merry Christmas. Now, if you haven't heard of that, well, you're probably not alone, but the idea is that we're not allowed to say Merry Christmas anymore, and things have just gotten out of hand in terms of political correctness. Now, Dennis Prager of PragerU, which is not a real university, by the way, decided to rerun a video that he released in 2016 as an ad in 2018, and talk about why we're no longer allowed to say Merry Christmas. The change from wishing fellow Americans Merry Christmas to wishing them Happy Holidays is a very significant development. Proponents of Happy Holidays argue it's no big deal. Proponents of Merry Christmas are making a mountain out of a molehill. But the Happy Holidays advocates want it both ways. They dismiss opponents as hysterical, but at the same time, in addition to replacing Merry Christmas with Happy Holidays, they have relentlessly pushed to replace Christmas vacation with winter vacation and Christmas party with holiday party. So then, which is it? Is all this elimination of the word Christmas important or not? The answer is obvious, it's very important. That's why so much effort is devoted to substituting other words for Christmas. And these efforts have been extraordinarily successful. In place of the universal Merry Christmas of my youth, in recent decades I have been wished Happy Holidays by every waiter and waitress in every restaurant I have dined, by everyone who welcomes me at any business, by my flight attendants and pilots, and by just about everyone else. When I respond, thank you, Merry Christmas, I often sense that I've actually created some tension. Many of those I wish Merry Christmas are probably relieved to hear someone who feels free to utter the C word, but all the sensitivity training they've had to undergo creates cognitive dissonance. Now, as someone who actually has worked in the service industry, my experience is completely different than what Dennis Prager is describing. Because... I was never told by my boss to say happy holidays instead of Merry Christmas. I said happy holidays on my own accord because happy holidays is technically more correct since we're celebrating multiple holidays, Christmas, New Year's. But I can tell you from firsthand experience that I actually encountered more difficult people when I said happy holidays as opposed to Merry Christmas. Do you understand what I'm saying? There was more outrage when I said happy holidays as opposed to Merry Christmas. In fact, I distinctly remember one customer kind of leaning in and telling me, look, you don't have to say happy holidays. I'm not down for that politically correct bullshit. Merry Christmas to you, man. And I remember thinking, wow, he actually thinks that he's telling me something profound. This idiot must be a Fox News viewer. <laughs> but the point is that if you say Merry Christmas in America, well, you're going to get in trouble, according to Dennis Prager. But the problem is that by saying that you can't say Merry Christmas, these Republicans and conservatives are kind of fucking up their own narrative because once Donald Trump was elected, well, apparently he saved Christmas, but now all of a sudden, since they're rerunning this ad again in 2018, we're not allowed to say Merry Christmas again. So which is it? Because Republicans ran this ad just last year. Thank you, President Trump. Thank you, President Trump, for letting us say Merry Christmas Okay, so this is getting really confusing. At first, I thought we weren't supposed to say Merry Christmas, but since Trump was elected, now we can say Merry Christmas again, finally, and not have to worry about going to jail for saying Merry Christmas. But all of a sudden now, there is still a war on Christmas, but Trump saved us from the war on Christmas. I'm confused. It, it, it just doesn't make any sense. But I think I'm confused because I'm too much of a lib cuck. And I just can't understand what these conservatives are saying because they have facts and reason and logic and all I have is 
well, none of that. So I think that if I truly want to embrace Christmas, then I do need to join the chorus of people who are fighting the war against Christmas, because I personally, I've said it before, I love Christmas. I've got the tree here specifically for this segment. But if I truly want to embrace Christmas, then I feel as if I have to do what these conservatives are doing. And I also need to fight against the war on Christmas. And I've got to cherry pick my own anecdote to demonstrate just how much of a war is being waged on Christmas. So just give me a second. I'm going to go ahead and search the web here for an example of the war on Christmas. Oh, I already found one. The Trump administration is canceling annual White House Christmas party for press. Holy shit, this is serious now. You're telling me the man who supposedly saved Christmas is now joining liberals to wage a war on Christmas? There really is a war on Christmas. If Trump is doing it, then as a liberal, since everything Trump does is bad, there must be a war on Christmas. I've got to tell Tucker about this. Tucker, look, I found an example of the war on Christmas that you are not going to believe. The individual who is ruining Christmas is Donald Trump. He's a mole. He said that he was in favor of Christmas. Tucker? Tucker? Tucker, do you hear me? Tucker! It seems like he's stuck. Like he can't move or something. Like he's unable to break out of the Tucker stare. It seems like the news that Donald Trump is also joining the war on Christmas caused some type of cognitive... What's the word I'm looking for again? Cognitive dissonance. Ah, cognitive dissonance. Thank you, Dennis. So look, I think that the only way we're able to describe just how robust the war on Christmas is and how bad it's gotten now that Donald Trump is also waging a war on Christmas is if I bring in someone else because I can't do this alone. So I'm going to introduce you to Humanist Report correspondent on the war on Christmas, Hot Dad. Hot Dad, can you please fill us in and tell us how bad it's gotten? Waking up on Christmas morning and something's changed. Gunfire bombs dropping earth shaking our country's ablaze. Starbucks cup, it's so grotesque and profane Because of that, Christmas is probably cancelled Unless we shout across the land, Christmas is what we demand My friend's mom said Merry Christmas and they took her away We're all so terrified of a youth's mouth to disintegrate No more Christmas cookies, just nondescript holiday sweet shades The holiday chemicals are turning on security detention facility for the same reason. Yeah.
Well, that's all that we've got. Special thanks to Hot Dad, our music performance. Hot Dad was really the perfect person who explained exactly how there's a war on Christmas, so please subscribe to him. Anyways, I hope that you guys have enjoyed the Humanist Report Christmas special. Excuse me, holiday special. We're not allowed to say that according to conservatives. Um, yeah, so tomorrow's Christmas, today is Christmas Eve, and I hope that you guys are able to spend some time with your family. If you don't celebrate Christmas, then I hope you have a nice Hanukkah, and if you don't celebrate anything, then I just hope that you're able to take some time to recover and recuperate after a really tiring political year. So with that being said, Thank you all so much for watching, and uh, Merry Holiday. I'm Mike Figueredo. This has been The War on The War on Christmas. Good night. Support this podcast by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash humanist report.